forget to do. So it's recording. Thanks so much to all of you for coming along. It's great to see so many people who have decided to sort of come along today and join in in this conversation. My name is Guruminda Bambra and I'm Professor of Postcolonial and Decolonial Studies at the University of Sussex. I'm also co-convener of the British Sociological Association's Postcolonial and Decolonial Transformation Study Group through whose auspices we're hosting this event today. And my co-conveners and the panelists for today are Megan Tinsley, Ali Megji, and Saskia Papadakis. Megan is Presidential Fellow in Ethnicities and Inequalities at the University of Manchester, and she's author of Commemorating Muslims in the First World War Centenary, Making Melancholia. And her research centers on nationalism, race, and the memory of empire. Ali is an assistant professor in the sociology department at the University of Cambridge, and he has a recent book out on decolonizing sociology. Saskia is a doctoral researcher at Royal Holloway University of London, where she's writing up her thesis on the English North-South divide, and she's published on her research within the Journal of Ethnic and Racial Studies. So this is our second year of monthly events, and we're really pleased to be opening it with a discussion on the use and value of the terms post-colonial, decolonial, anti-colonial. Now, the idea for this event came about in part as a consequence of Twitter spats, which we sort of saw happening uh, across social media about which term was better and which term was worse and all those sorts of things. And instead of contributing to the sort of febrileness of the Twitter space, we thought we'd take a step back and open up for dialogue and debate around the ways in which we use these terms, the significance that they have for our research and thinking, and also how we could most productively use them, you know, to think through their interconnections, the ways in which they overlap. And yes, of course, also discuss any productive contestations between them. So how we're going to organize this event is that we'll have short presentations by each of the conveners. And then really the space is open for a discussion amongst all of us about the ways in which we use these terms within our research, what they mean for us, what value they have, and, and so on. And I guess I should just underline that the event is envisaged as a conversation. It's not a competition to see which is the best term and there'll be no voting off of any term. So this is not Strictly or any of those other sorts of uh, programs. We really hope that this will be a collegial conversation to explore the various nuances and the contributions of the terms to our individual research, but also our collective research. So I'll very briefly set out my own engagement with these terms and before passing on to the others and then opening up. As I've long argued, both post-colonialism and decoloniality are developments within the broader politics of knowledge production. They both emerge in relation to political developments contesting the European colonial order. That is, they emerge in relation to movements of anti-colonialism. During the period of formal colonialism, anti-colonialism was as much a political position as it was an intellectual orientation. The aftermath of this period saw scholars seek to come to terms with the world ostensibly after colonialism, and this gave rise to the scholarly fields that coalesced under the terms post-colonialism and decoloniality. Very few people using these terms imagine that the world has moved beyond or past colonialism but the return to the prominence of the idea of anti-colonialism is an indication that such confusion does exist and that we need to sort of think through these terms further. For my own part, I guess I just want to say that I use the term post-colonialism as a theoretical provocation to call for the recognition of colonialism within our understanding and our politics. So I'll now pass on to my co-conveners who each have five to seven minutes for their initial contributions, and then we'll have a discussion. Just one quick note on the discussion. If you'd like to contribute, please put an X in the chat box so that I can see who wishes to contribute and then we'll unmute you in order for you to be able to participate. Depending on the numbers who wish to speak, I might be a little bit of a strict chair, but hopefully we can have a free flowing discussion on this. But first of all, over to Megan. 
Megan? Oh, Megan was having problems with her internet connection. So perhaps while she comes back online, I'll ask Ali to go. Sure, uh, we'll do. Thanks, Kaminda. Uh, thanks everyone for coming along today. It's um, it's so good to see that we've got like 200 people here. It's it's um, it's really amazing. So what I'm going to do is going to speak really briefly about the importance of decolonial projects and the decolonial, especially given the context where the decolonial has been subject to um, criticisms that it's too narrow. It's been subjected to conservative nationalist co-options. And especially given our present context where the possibilities of decolonial projects are actually becoming more and more difficult under accelerating crises and capital interests, which are typical to the modern world system. So firstly, I think the really important point is that the decolonial is actually the opposite to narrowness. It stands against myopia in the same way that it stands against universalism. This is what the whole emphasis on pluriversalism is supposed to convey within a decolonial tradition. So as captured by Césaire's famous quote when he says, provincialism, absolutely not. I'm not going to confine myself to some narrow particularism, but nor do I intend to lose myself in a disembodied universalism. There are two ways to lose oneself, through walled-in segregation in the particular or through dissolution into the universal. My idea of the universal is that of a universal rich with all that is particular, rich with all particulars, the deepening and coexistence of all particulars. In other words, taking from the Zapatistas, the aim of pluriversalism is to foster a world in which many worlds fit and to develop ongoing democratic horizontal recognitions and dialogues between these various worlds. It is through having many worlds within the world that we can actually have a world that's enriched and deepened. Supposedly anti-colonial projects like we saw potentially in India do not at all delink from the colonial world system because all they do is to fall into a narrow particular still based upon ethno-racial absolutisms. So essential to pluriversalism is fostering an ongoing horizontal dialogue or dialogues between different epistemic traditions and political praxis, especially those epistemic cosmologies that have been externalized as the West has placed itself at the center of the colonial world system. But we are far from realizing this pluriversalism. This pluriversalism itself is an exteriorized position. Uh, in other words, pluriversalism has been pushed to the exteriors and decolonial projects are still necessary because decolonization itself is an unfinished project. By calling decolonization an unfinished project, we are emphasizing now the disobedient spirit of decoloniality and the decolonial. We are rejecting those Eurocentric epistemologies and narratives, which take it as a given that time and progress are all linear processes. When Du Bois said in 1954 that the driving logic of capitalism was private profit from low wages of colored workers and low prices for priceless raw materials over the earth, he could have been referring to the political economy of the 17th century, just as much as he could have been talking about ongoing land dispossession in the Amazon right now in the name of beef and oil industries. Similarly, when Du Bois commented on how New York dictates the price of Cuban sugar, Haitian coffee and Dominican products, while tin from Bolivia, coffee from Brazil, gold from South Africa and uranium from Congo are all under foreign control with the native populations having their income and way of life dictated by powers outside their political control. He was not just talking about the world system of the 19th century, but was referring to that period of so-called world democracy as more and more states were gaining supposed independence. So in very, very, very short detail, I think it is completely appropriate to talk about the necessary requirement for decolonial projects or decolonial options in a time of regular, regular planetary crises. Progress cannot be taken as a given. And by emphasizing decoloniality and pluriversalism as options or projects, we are essentially emphasizing all of the energy, effort, and praxis that needs to be put into sustaining these options over time and space. So that's one of the um, main reasons why I regularly use the decolonial throughout my work. Okay, great. Thanks so much for that, Ali. Megan, are you able to? I am. Great. Apologies. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, apologies, everyone. My uh, Wi-Fi cut out just as I think Gaminder um, turned it over to me, but everything should be working now. Um, so thank you, everyone, uh, for joining this discussion. Thank you to my co-conveners um, for organizing it. I'm going to devote my comments to post-colonial theory and the prospects for liberation. This is a topic that's been on my mind for a while, uh, and it's the subject of my recent article in Critical Sociology uh, towards a post-colonial critical realism. Uh, the topic arose from my own frustration uh, shared with um, a lot of people in this room, I think, uh, with seeing post-colonial and decolonial thought represented as oppositional uh, in both their framing of empire and their response to it. Um, and in particular, the way that post-colonial theory was seen as detached from reality and detached from struggle. So as someone who was trained in post-colonial theory, I found that my own understanding of empire and coloniality has been enriched by decolonial thought. And so I'd like to speak about how post-colonial theory can contribute to the project of decolonization. And I hope that we'll have a discussion about how it might work in combination with decolonial and anti-colonial thought in that regard. So in the time that I have, I'm going to make two points. First, that post-colonial theory makes sense of the colonial discourses that underlie material structures. And second, that understanding the ontological reality of discourse contributes to anti-colonial movements. I'll address each of these in turn. Post-colonial theory is a fluid body of thought and its borders are blurred. Its intellectual trajectory derives from post-war anti-colonial humanism, structuralism and post-structuralism, and it's engaged critically with fields from world systems theory to energy humanities. And so I'm reluctant to make any overarching statement about what post-colonial theory is or isn't, but I will say that post-colonial theory, as I've read it and applied it to my work, takes European colonialism as a critical moment in knowledge production. In turn, colonial knowledge interacts with and reconstructs the identities of its authors and audiences. And so the task of post-colonial theory is to interrogate the authority of Europe's storylines, in Spivak's words, revealing the practices that produced and imposed them. It recovers knowledges that were violently suppressed by colonialism, and crucially, it produces new ways of thinking from the colonial encounter. Discourse matters because it produced the racial logic that divided humanity into camps, dehumanized most of the world's population, and justified the European conquest, genocide, and enslavement of people they deemed non-human. And indeed, the scale of colonialism only becomes clear when we make sense of discourse and materiality in tandem. Looking to mid-century anti-colonial humanists, for example, we find that thinkers and revolutionaries, including Césaire, Fanon, Cabral, and Nkrumah, made sense of colonialism as a system that bifurcated the world into clearly defined oppositional categories of colonizer and colonized, and then set about building economic and political systems that enriched the colonizer at the expense of the colonized. We also find, as Julian Goh argues, that even post-colonial theorists who focus heavily on discourse, uh, like Baba and Spivak, acknowledge the effects of colonial discourses on colonized subjectivities. That is, discourse produces the social world with all of its identities and institutions. Understanding colonialism as both discourse and materiality holds implications for anti-colonial social movements. European colonialism didn't end with the departure of soldiers and administrators because its racial logic endures and reproduces the social world from the colonized mind to the global climate crisis. And so anti-colonial movements must seek to overthrow colonial discourses. To offer just a few examples from scholars who fit somewhere within the blurred borders of post-colonial theory, uh, Fanon, beyond his support for the Algerian War for Independence, sought to eliminate the ontological divide between colonizer and colonized. Um, Said, equally, argued that discourse finds its fullest expression in the anti-colonial struggle. Prakash explores how colonized elites create the hybrid scientific knowledge that was at once Indian and Western. In the process, they disrupted the binary of colonizer and colonized. And Chakrabarti argues that the social milieu of Kolkata jute mill workers gave rise to class consciousness and ultimately to revolutionary action. In my longer paper, I also argue that the way we talk about the climate crisis produces particular courses of action. Saying that the crisis is the result of human activity isn't enough. Naming racial capitalism as the source of the crisis means that that system must be overthrown. The Wretched of the Earth Collective made this point in their open letter to Extinction Rebellion. Recognizing the material implications of discourse enables us to intervene in them knowing that decolonizing the mind, for example, holds real implications for the social world. 
By calling on sociologists to revisit post-colonial theory, uh, my hope is that this will contribute one piece to the larger unfinished project of decolonization. And so I'm glad we're having this conversation and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Great, thanks so much for that, Megan. And then we'll shift to Saskia. Uh, hi, thank you so much um, to uh, Gaminda and uh, my fellow conveners for organizing today. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, the importance of post-colonial scholarship and theory for my research uh, on the contemporary English North South divide, uh, for which I've recorded life story interviews with people from the North of England who live in London. Um, I'm interested in the North-South divide as an imagined geography, which is to say a set of cultural discourses that split the country between London and the Southeast, depicted as the national and global centre of power and finance, the stomping ground of the metropolitan elite, and the North, which is widely understood to be the natural home of the white working class who have delivered us Brexit in revenge for decades of Westminster-led deindustrialization and neglect. The archetypal narrative of the Northerner who moves to London invokes the white working class boy, like Billy Elliot, who moves from a traditional impoverished repressive North to seek financial opportunity personal reinvention and what Dave Russell calls the intellectual riches and social openness of the South. This class gendered and racialized story fails to address the role that British imperialism has played both in the industrialization and deindustrialization of the North and in London's wealth and status as a global city. It is also a story that leaves little room for the experiences of people of color making the same journey from North to South. Such individuals are seen as immigrants and racialized outsiders. The idea that they are out of place in the North is part of the same colonial imagination that has resulted in their entanglement with English spaces, society, and culture. Post-colonial scholarship challenges common sense understandings of England's North-South binary. Drawing on the work of writers such as After Bra and Paul Gilroy, I argue that neither the North nor London a static bounded entities produced endogenously within the nation. Instead, they are constantly in the process of becoming through their intermingling of diasporic cultures, colonial histories, and the differential location of individuals and communities within local, national, and global structures of power. In his theorization of post-colonial melancholia, Gilroy writes that the loss of Britain's empire has resulted in the loss of a fantasy of omnipotence, narcissistic racial fantasies, and a longing for imperial supremacy. The refusal to acknowledge the horrors of the imperial project means that the presence of migrants from former colonial possessions on the British mainland is profoundly disturbing. They serve as unwelcome reminders of the complexities of empire, the brutality of its governments, and the pain of its demise. I see representations of England's North-South divide as part of these melancholic ambiguities and delusions, a form of psychospatial splitting that attempts to maintain fantasies of white English supremacy in the face of unmanageable imperial loss. In this schema, bad feelings are located in the supposedly backwards traditional working class North and good feelings in an idealized London in the Southeast associated with power, progress and upward social mobility. Bra's conceptualization of England as a diaspora space offers one way in which the North-South divide might be reimagined. According to Bra, a diaspora space is continuously reconstituted and contested through the intertwining of genealogies of dispersion with those of staying put. Challenging dominant narratives where the white native English are seen as under threat from racialized migrant others, she writes that England is inhabited not only by those who have migrated and their descendants, but equally by those who are constructed and represented as indigenous. By complicating binaries and contesting structures of inclusion and exclusion, Bra's work makes space for the complexity of life stories of people who have migrated from north to south, opening the way for more hopeful, livable and democratic visions of English places. These post-colonial imaginations are vital to understanding what the writers of Empire's Endgame call the possible transformations of the COVID-19 crisis, 
despite the British government's claim to be prioritising the interests of the left-behind white working class of the North following the 2019 UK general election. It is the melancholic conceptualization of the North as a dysfunctional, outdated post-industrial landscape, a container for the unacknowledged rage and grief at Britain's imperial decline that determines the treatment of people and places identified as Northern. Enmeshed as it is in white anxieties centered on the racialized migrant other and the melancholic splitting of English places and people between the good and the bad, the North-South divide is in need of a reconceptualization that can adequately account for the colonial entanglements, past and present, that continue to shape England's psychological, spatial, and political geographies. Thank you. Great, thanks so much for that, Saskia. So we've had brief interventions from everybody uh, who's involved in the sort of post-colonial and decolonial transformation study group. And it's really a question of opening up and sort of uh, seeing where the conversation takes us. I mean, as I said, one of the things that prompted us to hold this event was this aspect of thinking about the value of these terms, how they're often presented as oppositional and yet there's perhaps more value to be gained through thinking through their intersections, the way they overlap and the ways in which people have mobilized them in different sorts of projects. So if anybody would like to share some initial thoughts, it's always the first couple of people to volunteer that it's always a little bit uh, hesitant. And then after that, it becomes much more um, free flowing. So you can either put your hand up using one of the, the tools, the reaction tool at the bottom, you could put an X in the chat box and uh, send that through and I can call on you. Or we could just sit here in silence and meditate on, on the theme. Ah, we have some. Okay, let's see. Nick. Um, hi, thank you so much. Um, I will just say I'm, I'm not as definitely not as well versed in these terms as the speakers, so it's it's obvious thing. But in an article I recently read by Ramon Rosfugo, I'm going to miss the surname. Um, it's article, but they were suggesting that uh, decoloniality as a, as a concept and decolonial thought better um, deals with both the kind of world systems. Um, thinking and, and the um, dependency theory side of things that's very um, socioeconomic and with the sociocultural focus that at least at the time when they were writing that is often associated with, um, with post-colonial thought. So, so um, their construction of, of you know, the decolonial project was that it's great for merging those and, and highlighting how both has maybe not focused on the other enough. So I just wanted to hear the your thoughts on that please thank you okay great thanks so much for that nick what i'll probably do is collect a few comments together and then ask uh the panelists to respond to what what's been said so gerard do you want to yeah hi thank you thank you so much uh, i mean my question is connected to the the very very setup of of this thinking through the definitions I, you know like i work uh, I'm based in UK, but I, my research is on India, and uh, and and nowadays, you know, it's all about the way I reflect is is the connections too. But one of the questions that is very hard to to square is the way the Hindu nationalists uh, deploy decolon decolonization as what they're doing by you know framing a particular. Uh, idea of uh, India as Bharat or whatever, you know, the, the whole, whole communical uh, Vedic, Vedic cultural Bharat to identifying any incursions, particularly by the Islam as the first colonialists and so on, and, and going really the, the modernity coloniality way as a, as a way to get out through it and, and, and also the Nazi way. And so it, it becomes very complicated, you know, like um, in many ways to say that one way forward for decolonial thinking is in fact to identify what specific places and particular conditions uh, articulate itself and configure itself as coloniality you know it, it's just a thought shared here and it, 
Yeah, no, great. Thanks for that. I think the uh, way in which some of these terms are being mobilized by scholars and communities that perhaps we don't necessarily think of in the first instance when we use these terms should give pause for thought in terms of how they're being used and, and so on. Um, is it Srividya? Hi, um, thanks, uh, Gurminder. Uh, this is Srividya and I'm based in Bangalore, India. So uh, it's my first time being in, in this group. So uh, excuse me if my question sounds a little bit um, mad. Uh, so my question is that there seems to be, uh, at least to me, I'm, I'm not from an academic background. So uh, there is this um, uh, schism or there is this huge gap between what academia is talking about uh, and researching about and you know talking about. Uh, and then what we call practice, right? So I work for an international NGO, uh, Action Aid International. So, and, and what exactly is happening on, on, on the ground in the field, in, 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 in the thing? So um, as, as researchers, what do you, you know, what, what is the thought there? So to make research more um, uh, practical, or uh, usable in practice, because that's also a part of, uh, you know, the whole decolonization debate, right? So the the idea of uh, certain things being discussed in very elite circles, uh, whereas the masses, so-called masses, discussing something something else or something different, and therefore what um, uh, the previous speaker Jay was also talking about the appropriation of certain terms uh you know uh by by because the space is created right because you are not able to connect these two totally different worlds so so if you could comment or if the speakers could comment a little bit about you know the practicality mm -hmm. of of research taking it beyond university campuses to to practice yeah great thanks so much for that we'll certainly pick that up um marina hi everyone thanks so much for for brilliant presentations. So thinking about the terms of post-colonial and decolonial, I, um, and also through my reading of um, writings of Walter Mignola and Madina Plastanova, I came across a critique of post-colonial scholarship and literature as being overwhelmingly focused on the British empire, French empire, and, and the, their former colonies. And so these two authors, they um, raised this criticism that um, the non-Western empires, which partially adopted and transformed different colonial discourses, so they very often completely overlooked in post-colonial literature, and they suggest that the decolonial option and, and frame is more useful in addressing the varieties of different imperial practices so I was just wondering what you what you think about all that and if you can comment and if you can you know maybe reflect on this out loud that would be great thanks great thanks so much I'll take one more and that will be a group of five and then I'll ask uh, Megan Ali and Saskia to respond so Ali Kassim uh hi hi everyone it's it's great to see you um yeah I just have a quick question and, and I was wondering if the speakers can talk about it from the different perspectives. Um, and it kind of builds on what Ali was mentioning in relation to time. And I'm wondering how we see post-colonial, decolonial, and anti-colonial thought differently engaging with the historical and with, with, with what has been turned into the past by Eurocentric modernity. Um, and I, if, if, so I would say there's a different relationship and, and, and decolonial thought situates itself differently from post-colonial thought and from a lot of anti-colonial thought in relation to questions of progress, of development, um, and, and to those civilization and models that have been labeled as backward and as something that we need to move beyond. And, and for me, I think that's a major difference between post and decolonial thought that I'm wondering if, um, um, if, if speakers can kind of comment on or comment on. Thank you. All right, great. Thanks for that, Ali. Uh, Megan, do you want to maybe go first in the response? And then I'll go to Ali and then Saskia. All right. Uh, my, my thoughts are very scattered at the moment, but um, I am comforted by the knowledge that this is a discussion. And so I'm looking forward to how the uh, 
the other panelists and um, and um, attendees will um, respond. Um, and I'm apologies. I'm not going to remember who asked uh, who asked what. Um, but on the um, on the centrality of the British and French Empire to the literature on post-colonial theory, um, I, I tend to agree with that. That that is um, that is the the standpoint of um, of, um, of the subaltern school and the successive schools of, um, of post-colonial thought. Um, and it's it, it's difficult in ways to, to generalize beyond those empires, nor is it advisable to do so. Um, but I recently came across the work of David Tobin, um, who's written about uh, the oppression of the Uyghurs um, through a post-colonial lens. Um, so reading China as um, an empire state. Um, there's also, um, Sorry, so uh, I, I would recommend um, their work as well. Um, uh, Quan Xing Chen has also written on deimperialization um, as kind of a critique of um, of the Eurocentrism of um, of postcolonial thought, um, and has sought to to read imperial history in East Asia through that lens, while drawing some concepts from postcolonial theory, but also critiquing it um, through um, through the lens of a different history. Um, and I think I, I think I, I, I think it's absolutely fine and advisable to make that, that critique um, and to acknowledge the limitations of postcolonial thought. And that that is one of the ways that I think decolonial thought can intervene critically um, through the lens of indigenous studies um, and through the experiences of um, societies in Latin America um, uh, uh, that were colonized by Spain. Um, I. I think that those schools of thought should be in, in greater conversation um, and uh, and that we can draw lessons from one another um, and even reread the British and French empires um, through uh, through a more critical lens in light of others. Um, there was a question about gross Vogel and cultural uh, study or the reading decolonial thought as um, a political and economic critique that engages with world systems theory. Um, as compared to post-colonial critique that focuses more on culture and discourse. And I would agree that that is, you know, the primary focus of both of those schools. Um, I, I value the, the genealogy of post-colonial um, study that's, that's been in dialogue with cultural studies, um, in particular the work of, of Stuart Hall, um, who's spoken to both uh, schools. And I would, I would be very reluctant to say that that decolonial thought shouldn't um, uh, shouldn't draw lessons from um, from cultural studies that have been linked to postcolonial theory, um, or say that you know, the, the standpoint of postcolonial theory hasn't been as valuable as as decolonial thought in that regard. And there also, I mean, there there was a wave in the early two thousands of postcolonial thought that engaged critically with world systems theory. Um, uh, Priya Gopal, well, Priya Gopal, who doesn't consider herself to be a post-colonial theorist, but has engaged with post-colonial thinkers, um, has written about um, uh, about uh, the Iraq War, um, and uh, has uh, engaged with post-colonial thinkers um, uh, in a way that I think is helpful there too. Um, these are just some initial initial works and initial thinkers that come to mind. Um, not an exhaustive response at all. Um, but I think that is the value of this conversation is to bring together different uh, different perspectives. So I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Great, thanks a lot for that, Meg. And I'll pass over to Ali. And there was a request that could you maybe put links to some of the articles you were mentioning and the authors you were talking about into the chat if possible, thanks. Ali? Thanks, yes. So like Megan, my thoughts are, are quite scattered, but even though I've had more time to, to potentially organize them, it won't be as organized as Megan's. Um, so I'll probably start with that question about whether or not the post-colonial took kind of like material analysis as seriously as the decolonial school or whether they kind of focused a bit too much on um, kind of cultural representation and so on. Because I think that just like what Megan said in her presentation was that there are tons of people who sometimes get associated with the post-colonial tradition who very much were analyzing the world system. So, you know, Megan mentioned Fanon, Cezanne, Krumer, and so on. These were all people who basically were critics of global capitalism, right? So, and it's really interesting because they, they're used within a post-colonial tradition, but they're also used within a decolonial tradition. So once again, it kind of shows you how that boundary can be really porous. And to say that one focuses materially on the world system, whilst the other focuses a bit too much on cultural representation. I think that it creates a bit too much of a binary 
that those on the decolonial do seem quite happy to support sometimes, but I think that the binary is a lot more porous than it first seems. Um, then there's a question about um, all of this stuff about decolonization, there's all of this academic research around decolonization, and how do we actually make sure that the research itself is engaged and it's not just happening in an ivory tower. And I think that that's the whole purpose, both of the post-colonial and of the decolonial traditions. So just coming back to what I was talking about at the beginning with the um, Zapatistas and their desire to create a world in which many worlds fit and this whole notion of pluriversalism, you know, pluriversalism wasn't thought up in an ivory tower. It was fought out in anti-colonial struggles, which is why people cite the Zapatistas, why they cite Césaire when they're talking about um, the notion of pluriversalism. And right now the Zapatistas are in, well, some of the Zapatistas are in Dublin um, and they're engaging in kind of like the fight against the fourth world war, right? They're engaging in the fight against neoliberalism right now by engaging in international uh, collaborations and international conversations between different epistemic traditions, just like the, the, the premise of pluriversalism. So that's a really good example of how you have a concept pluriversalism that is used in academic research, but itself arises from anti-colonial struggles in the material world. Uh, and then lastly, oh, two more really quick reflections. There was Ali's question about time. And yeah, I think it's completely true that one of the best, one of the really profound interventions of the decolonial school was to center 1492 as the beginning of the world system, whereas potentially the post-colonial tradition sometimes uh, delays that start point of the beginning of the colonial world system. But once again, I don't think that that's a necessary divide between the two because it is really depending on who you're counting as a decolonial and who you're counting as a post-colonial theorist. Um, and then lastly, there was the concept about co-opting of terms. And I think that it's really important that we remember that sometimes, well, always concepts can be empty and we fill them with meaning. We give them meaning, we give them purpose. So if you think about European colonialism, they had the concept of civilization, but as we know from people like Cesare and so on, when they were talking about civilization, they were actually doing very anti-civilizational things, right? They were saying, we're giving you civilization through enslaving you, through exploiting you, through expropriating your land. That's not civilization. So they had an empty concept and they gave it a particular meaning. Other people could talk about civilization and mean something completely different and something a lot more... Um, equitable and democratic and so on. So we can see them filling the concept of civilization with something else. This is exactly the same with terms like coloniality, right? So when we see Hindu nationalists using the notion of coloniality, it doesn't mean that they're using a concept in a particular way that's sympathetic to the decolonial tradition. It just means that they've taken a concept which is empty and they've given it a particular meaning, which is actually quite different to how it's used in uh, proper anti-colonial struggles. So those are my thoughts. Great. Thanks for that, Ali. Although I guess one of the questions that then comes up from what you've just said is, is the concept empty or is it that they've used it in different sorts of ways? And so that, that would be something that perhaps we can pick up uh, subsequently as well. Saskia, would you like to? Uh, yeah, I won't take up too much time because I'm conscious that other people might want to speak, but um, I just want to pick up on the idea of um, theorists being kind of divorced from political movements and sort of taking ideas and using them in kind of like the ivory tower of the university um, in a way that doesn't really reflect what's happening on the ground. And I think, I guess, the value of doing, uh, I think this happens in kind of post and decolonial research is that um, it is, tends to be certainly in the context that I've seen very interlinked with what's happening in the ground. And like you do see a lot of as Ali said, like in exchange, interchange between kind of the more sort of academic um, actors and activists themselves. And I wouldn't say that they're necessarily as neatly distinguishable as that. Um, for example, uh, Empire's Endgame, which was recently published and kind of talks a lot about like what's going on in the UK at the moment, uh, has 10 writers. And I would say like all of them are involved in kind of activist projects. Um, I've definitely been like, you know, and, and uh, the UN climate change convention is happening in Glasgow next week. That's got a huge number of academics involved with what is a huge activist push to try and pressure governments into uh, taking action on climate change, climate crisis. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know if it's true to say that they're divorced. Obviously, um, there are 
uh, people who don't engage. But yeah, or like, you know, even, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I would say that as a, as theories, they are like tend to be more engaged than with lots of other aspects of academia, although there's always more work to do. So yeah, I would just maybe add to that. Great, thanks for that, Saskia. Um, I think, I mean, perhaps one of the things that we can also pick up because is, is the aspect of these theories not necessarily being divorced, but what work, or is it incumbent upon us as academics, those of us who are academics within the room, to ensure that the terms and the arguments that we're making are more widely accessible and engaged with, and how do we do that work? as well. There was a question in the chat from Tracy Skillington asking how do the speakers make sense of CO2 colonialism and that's a new term that's gaining sort of quite a lot of credence in relation to issues of climate change and and so on. So I'll put that there and I'll ask Eddie to uh, ask a question. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, yeah, first, just uh, thanks actually for having this. I mean it's really important, I think a really timely um, discussion and forum and um, and really insightful um, presentations at the beginning there as well. And um, I think for me, I think I want to raise sort of two points. One is sort of more general sort of provocation, if you like, before giving a more specific example about Ireland in particular. And I think I want like I'm wondering what the what other people here think about firstly the idea that in a sense sort of the the anti-colonial is the is the material and ideological basis of both the post and decolonial approaches, in a sense of it being, uh, you can only you, you can only have post colonial theory with with in the aftermath of um, uh, uh, anti colonial struggle that has both succeeded and failed in a sense, succeeded in the terms of um, getting rid of the the immediate presence of the colonizers, but still being stuck with the with the with the ideological and discursive residue, as well as the economic um, uh, constraints to do with that, and I think. The reason why I'm thinking about this is um, in the Irish context, I mean, it's very sort of, it's sort of in some ways it can be a blind spot, especially in sort of wider discussions around, around uh, coloniality and especially in the academy. And more specifically, I'm thinking of sort of the emergence of an Irish post-colonial studies in the 1980s, which was very much to do with um, creating a space in which it was possible to talk about Ireland as a colonial entity or the colonized entity, which was effectively sort of frozen out of mainstream discourse. Um, and it was sort of quite a quite a uh, erratic discourse at the time. However, parallel to that was obviously an ongoing conflict in which people who would have argued themselves to be concretely engaged in their practice and a struggle of an anti-colonial mm -hmm. struggle um, sort of led to this sort of rupture or, or disjunct between the, the, the theoretical and the discursive and the, and the sort of the the very ground upon which the post-colonial is actually made possible, i.e. the anti-colonial struggle. And I think today we're faced with this, the intervention or the, in a sense, in Ireland, we've all we've had a long sort of history of the practice of decoloniality, going back to the 19th century and the Gaelic language revival and other times. Um, and, and these applications are coming to Belfast, for example, um, on Tuesday or Wednesday to talk to the Irish language revivalists there. Um, and I think that in terms of how the sanitizing effects that academic academia can have, I mean, we're having conversations now in Dublin about taking down a statue of Bishop Barclay, um, um, who was part of the Protestant descendancy, but nobody mentions that part of it, who, who made a lot of money from the slave trade. Um, but yet nobody wants to talk about the fact that the Irish language isn't recognized in the North of Ireland as being um, as being um, a, an indigenous an indigenous and state recognized language. So I'm just wondering, sort of, sort of trying to tease out sort of the the temporal and sort of theoretical interlinkages and ruptures between these sort of these very key key terms um, and sort of looking at Ireland as a possible a possible example in the ways in which sort of the pitfalls as well as the possible the possible um, usefulness of these um, of these uh, um, concepts. Thanks. Okay, great. Thanks so much for that, Eddie. And yes, I think you're right. You know, there has to be much more of an engagement with. The place of Ireland within this <clears throat> broader field. Is it Iran? Yes, hi. Hi. Hey, um, I'm going to just position myself first before I begin because I'm in this kind of like in the middle kind of uh, position. Um, uh, I've been teaching geography, um, so I've been a school teacher. Now I've just started my um, PhD research on exactly this. So just conceptualizing the, this concept of decolonizing. 
and whether there's a place for it in um, school geography, so to speak, or the school curriculum, because um, I know it's becoming like a very sort of popular buzzword for some, and for others, it's got, a, it's got like a deeper kind of me meaning. So I just wanted to just, just quickly just talk a little bit briefly about how uh, we can look at it in the ground, uh, on the ground, as someone mentioned earlier. Um, so basically, as a school teacher, you see real sort of um, uh, examples of like products of po post-colonialism, don't you? Like me, myself, my uh, parents, my forefathers are a product of post-colonialism. And for me, I think it's a very important um, sort of um, uh, discourse to sort of bring into even school geography at that young age, but there's a confusion um, about what these terms mean um, in the academ uh, academia sort of uh, arena. So I'm just thinking, how do we sort of translate that even furthermore? Like how do we, what's the word, scaffold it downwards um, to sort of um, make sense to teachers who want to decolonize? So I think um, what my question is, is you know, is, is decolonizing a form of saying uh, anti-racism and uh, saying no more exploitation, no more racialized, racialization of people? I mean, is it, is it everything um, like encompassed into one sort of um, nutshell and, and then presented like that so that we can sort of improve the way we kind of think of the world? Because obviously I've been brought up in the UK but I'm from Pakistan. When I go to Pakistan, I'm almost, I almost sometimes feel like a colonialist. I, I you know, with my family and, and I'm treated differently as well. And sometimes I have to literally say, please don't treat me like this. Don't, don't treat me different. I, I want to be, you know, a part of like, you know, the community. I don't want to be treated um, differently. So I'm just, uh, yeah. So that, I guess my question is, um, yeah. So, sorry, I think I've confused myself now. <laughs> I know it's the confusion. There's this sense of the way in which we make these concepts accessible even to school children at yeah. younger ages and to be clearer about what they're referring to and what they're perhaps not. Yeah, because yeah. we are That's using right. the word now. We're using the word, but mm -hmm. we don't know what it means. And yeah. I, I actually came to this lecture to sort of make sense of um, what it means. And I think I'm getting more confused now. <laughs> so, well, let's see if we can help you with that. Thanks for the question, Iram. That's great. Amal? Hi, everyone. Oh, let me turn on the video. I forgot that it was off, um, doing multiple things. Uh, uh, thank you, everyone, for the really interesting uh, presentations. I really appreciated it. Um, and it's also been a really helpful to me. I, I finished my PhD last year, and I'm teaching um, in a post. Uh, um, it's it's the, the lecture of race and de politics of race and decolonial studies. And even I am not sure when I'm crossing into uncharted territory. Um, particularly because of the circumstances of anti-racism and how it intersects with colonial legacies. Um, having a North American education in Canada, I was taught that post-colonialism as a field was about knowledge production, but it was interconnected um, with uh, material projects of resisting material domination. So the key text that I was taught um, this on the basis of was Orientalism, but I was taught Orientalism, which is usually, um, I guess, whether it's called a cultural take, but I was taught it as like, this is the, the preamble to understanding how material domination occurs by the person who originally taught me about what post-colonialism was and using Orientalism to examine projects of Middle Eastern regionalism. So I've never known post-colonialism to be um, the cultural legacy. I've had this conversation, I believe, with um, Gaminda before at Warwick, actually. We had a similar workshop where everyone was talking about it being about literature studies and culture studies. And I had, I, I knew that Edward Said had these other um, backgrounds to him, but I, it wasn't how I was taught what post-colonialism was. So it was completely unrelated. And another thing I would love the speakers to comment to is the situation of um, racialized minorities in North America and the global North, because you have, um, it's not, it's not anti-Western, but you have and their existence doesn't compute with the structures that exist in the West. So you have um, William Edward Burkhard Du Bois, uh, Fanon and others commenting on the circumstances of the global more in particular to racial oppression, but it's more anti-colonial and anti-imperial than from what I understand anything else. 
Um, it can't be decolonial, I've been told, which is fine, but there, there are elements that have intersections. So I, I guess um, I heard the previous um, question about anti-colonialism. I think I would buttress onto that and just see how we can situate circumstances of racial discrimination as issues of post-colonial or decoloniality. Great, thanks so much for that, Amal. I'll perhaps go to the panelists now, starting with Ali, and just as a quick reminder of the, the, the different themes that we've had so far. So it's comments on CO2 colonialism, on anti-colonialism as a material basis for post-colonialism and decoloniality in the context perhaps of thinking of Ireland, the way in which many of these terms come to be buzzwords, in which case they're simplified, but is the simplification too much or do we need to simplify them in order to sort of have them be more accessible, particularly as in terms of sort of thinking about school teaching and then building from that for Amal's question just now around racism and the intersections with colonialism and I guess perhaps questions of internal colonialism, which were brought to the fore by, by uh, people like Stokely Carmichael and others in terms of thinking about the place of African-Americans within the US. So, Ali. <laughs> quite, a lot of, uh, quite a lot of material. Um, all really, really good questions. So I'll, I'll try my Cute. best. To, yeah, <laughs> I'll try my best to give some thoughts for them. So I think that the... Um, the notion of kind of anti-colonialism as a basis is just really important because the whole point is that there's a reason why colonialism is in the terms, right? Colonialism is in the term decolon decoloniality, decolonialism is in the, is in the notion of post-colonialism as well. Um, but I think that both the decolonial and the post-colonial are kind of defining themselves in terms of what they're against. So, you know, in a decolonial tradition, it's, a, it's about a delinking from the colonial world system, and the uh, kind of like hubris of the zero point, the kind of uh, the, the project of Western universalism that's associated with it. But it's not just defined in terms of what it's against, it's also defined in terms of what it stands for. And I think that what it stands for would remain, let's say a truth, regardless of whether or not the reality of colonialism or coloniality is still there. By which I mean that the decolonial decoloniality is about creating a world, as, as I kind of keep saying, a world in which many worlds fit. It's about creating a democratic world where democracy isn't just this empty signifier, but it's, it's a realized ongoing practice. So I think that it's really helpful to think of anti-colonialism as a kind of a, a material backdrop or kind of like um, almost like an engine for, de for, for um, decoloniality and post-colonialism, but that kind of analysis will only take you so far when you think about what happens once we're beyond coloniality, if that's even a possibility. Um, then there's the question about um, internal colonialism and all that stuff. And I think that there's really interesting indigenous critiques of that because they say that internal colonialism can only kind of take you so far when you're thinking about racism within somewhere like the US, simply because the very notion of internal colonialism overlooks how places like the US are still settler colonies and are still in, involved in ongoing settler colonization. Um, but people like Du Bois were like so good at being able to tie together racism within the boundaries of specific places in the West to kind of like coloniality much more generally. So he has this really good line where it's like the same color line that runs through the, um, Mississippi runs, you know, the, basically the same color line that runs through Mississippi is also going through India right, when he was writing about um, the British colonization in India. And there's a really good book by Menanda Sai called The United States of India, which talks about that quite well. So um, I really recommend that book. And then um, lastly, the CO2 colonialism stuff really fits in with what I was saying about settler colonialism. Settler colonialism is a prime example of land dispossession and land dispossession in a hope of turning that land into something that can be made profitable, right? So in my um, beginning intervention, I was talking about the Amazon and how particularly in Brazil, uh, Bolsonaro and leading business um, leaders are encouraging people to burn down trees in order to have more space for cattle farming where they can then become leading exporters in beef and so on. These are all really clear examples of how settler colonialism is an ongoing project in which is responsible for the climate crisis, but also Du Bois's comment that the driving logic of capitalism involves exploitation of raw materials of the earth once again makes you think that 
yeah, the whole colonial world system, which we call global capitalism, is based around ecological crises. I know that um, Megan's written a really, really good paper about this, so I'm not going to say anything more about it because Megan will be able to say it way better than I can. And I think that those are the thoughts that I'll share with everyone. Great. Thanks so much for that, Ali. So I'll move to Saskia. Um, yeah, thank you so much for your questions. Uh, I, yeah, we'll pick, <laughs> pick and choose because there's just so many ideas. Um, they're all really interesting. I wanted to respond to um, Eddie's point about Ireland and, yeah, the idea of kind of uh, Ireland as being, you know, kind of um, produced a kind of anti-colonial struggle, which is uh, what brought about this kind of post-colonial moment in the 80s. Um, and yes, of course, like I, I agree that, you know, you can't have post decolonial without the kind of uh, attempt to break from colonialism that was represented by different forms of anti-colonial struggle. Um, I guess, yeah, the Irish context, I think, is a really interesting one in terms of thinking about uh, race, racism in um, a post-colonial situation, because I think Ireland has done this really interesting thing of like kind of ignoring whiteness and like not really bringing in um, anti-racism as part of a post-colonial kind of um, like the, the post-colonial thinking that's happened there I think is often neglected to think about racism um, and yeah I think that's kind of a problem that sort of runs through um, like different engagements with kind of Irish nationalism and things like that. Um, so yeah, that was my thoughts on that. Um, yeah, in terms of making uh, terms more accessible, I saw someone in the chat and I think it's worth highlighting that um, Gaminda has organized Global Social Theory, which is an amazing website and uh, would recommend it to anyone. And also if you have, uh, if you think stuff's missing from it, you can write your own contributions. So <laughs> please do that. Um, yeah, and um, what's I going to say? Yeah, I think like maybe this is just like my own nerdiness, but the idea of internal colonialism really made me think of um, lots of people who write about the English and South divide uh, talk about the North as being like London's colony, which I've always thought was like a totally bizarre <laughs> way of looking at it. And like people are sort of like very passionately arguing this, which has always felt to me like a kind of uh, slightly absurd version of um, some kind of post-colonial take on England because of, yeah, there's just like, it just doesn't do justice to uh, the brutality of colonialism despite what's gone on in the North through deindustrialization. Um, so yeah, uh, it's, I always kind of treat the idea with, with a bit of suspicion. Um, but yeah, I'll hand over to Megan. Okay, great, Megan. Oh, thanks. Oh, am I frozen? No, 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 you're there. I, I, I think I was briefly frozen, but I think I'm back now. I, okay, <laughs> great. Um, yeah, thank you for all of these really rich uh, questions. Um, I'll, I'll pick up on the question of CO two colonialism. Um, what what I find particularly helpful about that term is that, well, first it displaces the nation state um, as um, both the engine of colonialism and, uh, and the site of, of colonization. Um, I, I think climate justice, anti-colonial climate justice discourse in general um, frames, um, frames uh, the relationship between global capitalism and uh, colonialism in a way that is helpful for thinking about histories of European empire and uh, its contemporary Neo-colonial manifestations, um, it, you know, in ways that don't uh, they don't honor uh, national borders, um, but where the nation state remains relevant as an actor, um, and where um, uh, corporations um, and non-state actors also play um, an important role. Um, on a similar note, uh, I think the the conversation about internal colonialism, um, it, you know, in that discussion, I agree with Ali that we we need to be talking about settler colonialism, um, but we also need to be aware of the limitations of uh, talking about the nation state um, as the unit of analysis. Um, one concept that I find particularly helpful is um, Grossvogel's reading of Fanon, um, as the zone of being and the zone of non-being. Um, so Grossvogel argues that this is um, 
a uh, the, the zone of being um, is the zone of humanity, the zone of whiteness, the zone of law and order, the zone of nonviolence. Um, and it's it constructs itself in opposition to and by the oppression of the zone of non-being, um, which is characterized by, by blackness, by violence, um, by coercion, extraction. Um, for Grossvogel and for Fanon, um, these, these zones don't simply map on to nation states and national borders, but also onto individual bodies. Um, and so when we talk about racism within the global north, um, I would argue that we are talking about colonialism, um, and we always have been talking about colonialism um, because race is is um, constructed through um, global capitalism, colonialism, the slave trade. Um, they've never been separate from one another, um, and uh, and the the nation state um, racialized itself as white through violence against black bodies. Um, the northern nation state. Um, I, I also find De Souza Santos um, helpful um, for making sense of this question. Um, he uh, he frames the line between the North and South, the line between um, colonizer and colonized, um, black and white, racialized line as the abyssal line, um, which uh, which sounds more um, more geographic and more spatial. Um, but he also argues that um, it. Uh, that, that it, it maps onto individual bodies. Um, both De Souza Santos and Grossvogel. Um, um, are uh, within the category of decolonial thinkers. Um, but, you know, uh, drawing from Fennel, Fennel influenced post-colonial thinkers as, as well. Um, and so there, again, I think it's helpful to, to blur that line a bit. Um, uh, just a, a, a final brief comment on making terms comprehensible um, and accessible. Um, to be honest, in my experience, um, students, school students and university students, understand what decolonization means. They understand what's at stake and what the project uh, must entail. Um, and, uh, and they're not afraid to challenge institutions um, in the process. My, my concern really is with um, people in power appropriating the term decolonization um, and, and decoloniality. Um, in my view, that's, that's the greater danger for diluting the terms. Um, when decolonization is read as a synonym for diversity, um, and is um, and, and when you know institutions present themselves as um, as having their own initiative to decolonize the curriculum to decolonize the the university, um, that I think poses a greater danger to diluting the concept than um, than making them accessible to uh, to young people. Um, so uh, so that's that I I, th I think that's a hopeful um, view. I think that uh, that young people know what they're talking about and they uh, and they're uh, they're not afraid to uh, to ask big questions and call for systemic change. When it comes to decolonization. All right, thanks so much for that, all of you. And I think, you know, just to echo Megan's point on that, the issue is not whether something is confusing when we first engage with it, but that's part of the process of learning. You can't learn anything if you're not initially confused by something because then you would already know it. So we've got a few more questions in the chat and also a few people with their hands up. So I'll ask Suming perhaps first to ask her question. Um, thanks, Gurminder. Thanks, everyone, for a really excellent discussion and really thought provoking. I suppose I'd like to um, push Megan a little bit more on what it is that the students understand and get. And my question really is about, you know, what is the decolonial episteme beyond what it is not? So I'm kind of interested in teasing out what the world is of the many worlds. We get the pluriversalization and, you know, I suppose I'm, I, how does the realism part fit with the relativizing part, I suppose, is the question that I have. And, you know, how do we construct or, or, or think about in a substantive way, what the, the horizon of emancipation is as, contrasted to the horizon of critique. So I hope that's, I know Ali has has actually quite nicely answered some parts of this question already. And I want to acknowledge that, but I still want to push it a little bit more. Great, Thank thanks so much for that, Sue. Jairaj? Hi, thanks. Uh, I mean, it's a question uh, similar to my previous one, but you know, like, uh, I mean, you know, when I write and I have written about this, uh, 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 but from the perspective of 
thinking who is the colonizer, what is colonized, and what is to be decolonized mean clearly from the perspective of Western colonialism, um, broadly speaking, in, you know, specifically British colonialism, etc. Uh, it is easier and clearer, not rather than easier, it's clearer. And, and when it becomes more complex is that when you enter into conversations or different kind of projects, um, so the, as I mentioned earlier, Hindu nationalism story, or, uh, or um, you know, the, the anti-caste activists conversation in India, for instance, it's, it presents an extremely uh, complex questions onto, onto these categories, mobilization. And, and I'll come back to why I am saying this uh, at the end. So, so for instance, if you look at Periyar, you know, I, I, I don't know how many of you know these contexts, but if you look at some of the early anti-caste work, uh, um, scholars and mobilizers, you know, caste is a 2000 year old history, at least in the documentation. Um, Periyar considered, in fact, the British gave modernity and hope, okay. <clears throat> He, he liked it and it, it was important for them. Uh, Fule thought so too. And then comes to Ambedkar, it's much more complicated. Uh, Ambedkar's uh, equality, liberty and fraternity, he argues by end of his career is not really from French, but from the Buddhism uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, it becomes extremely complex uh, when you think about decoloniality and anti-coloniality with caste, uh, anti-caste activists and scholars. Um, because you know, one of the argument, of course, the modernity was the way out of the historical uh, story. And just to wind my question up, or rather the thought up, I mean, not all liberatory projects have to be uh, framed under anti-colonial, decolonial, and post-colonial, perhaps. But at the same time, I think don't doesn't this decolonial, post-colonial, anti-colonial. Uh, originates and, and, and in many ways can continue to, to develop its frames around certain kind of particular 1492 and post, you know, this kind of Western colonialism. So in many ways, is it, isn't it, is it better or not to, to, to take it beyond uh, that binary conversation, you know, and centered in the metropole and only makes sense in this manner in the metropole elsewhere, it becomes much complicated. Yeah, no, that's a really great, uh, really great point and question. Thank you so much for that. And we will definitely um, pick that up. I'll just take a few more questions before the next round. So Nick, are you able to? Yeah. yeah thank you. Mine's just a very quick one. Um, we heard about this idea of um, horizontal dialogue as essential to uh, the project of pluriversalism. And that's really exciting. But um, I'm from South Africa and I know obviously uh, decolonization is, is a big movement here, but, but one um, scholar who I admire is quite against us using South American decolonial thought. So, so, so beyond a conversation, just using that theory here, um, mixing it with um, African decolonial thought. And he thinks that um, there's a lot of risk in that if it's not done carefully. And so my question was just um, on, on that, on the idea of when there's not, when there isn't this dialogue, when there's not, hasn't been, and it's more just, um, we've just got written theory. Can we use it? How do we use it? Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. No, thanks a lot for that. Again, a, a, an important intervention. I'm going to raise, um, read out some of the questions that, that are in the chat that might've got lost because there's been quite a lot of conversations going on there. There was, a question from Abdul Rahman asking, can we differentiate between indigeneity and indigenous people? How do we make sense of indigeneity in the context of the North Indian region, for example, where people have been collaborators of empire and still part of internal colonialism regimes? So I think, you know, again, with so many of these terms, how we understand what constitutes the category of the indigenous will also have a consequence for the way in which we mobilize that term in particular places. And as Nick has just very nicely sort of set out, it's not clear that these terms will always be transferable from one location to another without the work of translation being done to sort of have some sense of how the meaning shifts as we go across different sorts of regions. Um, there was another question 
in the chat from Daniel, who was saying that be interested in the thoughts of the contributors on the extent to which post-coloniality and decoloniality can fit within disciplinary frameworks that are used to organize knowledge production in the category or do the categories of disciplinarity dissolve in the face of de post and anti-colonial critique it's another really valuable point a, a question for you ali specifically about how do you what is it like to work on the decolonial in the space of Cambridge. So that's the sort of positionality question, I guess, that, that's coming up there. And um, yes, Jairaj, if you could post the names of the scholars that you were mentioning in the chat, Perrier and others, and perhaps some work. I know a um, colleague at Wolverhampton's doing some work also on, on, on the work of Perrier and, and so on. If you could just put that in the chat, that would be great. Um, Saskia, are you happy if I come to you first in response to? Yeah, uh, sure. So um, I feel like a lot of these questions are about um, kind of context, and you know, in what context can can you use these terms, and what like do they work in disciplines? Do they work in different regions, different places? Can you kind of transfer different ideas across? Um, without some kind of risk being involved or some kind of distortion. Um, and I think, I don't know, I guess, I guess my instinct is to say that um, surely like to a certain extent, like all, all scholarship involves kind of thinking really carefully about um, the terms you're using and like, if you can engaging with, uh, the works in the context that they were written um, and applying them to different contexts. That's kind of, um, I, don't, I don't mean to say that in a flippant way. I think it's really important um, that that's like a challenge that's taken seriously um, because yeah, like there's all kinds of uh, differences between different places and kind of power relationships and um, you know, how different theories get formed is totally influenced by our environments kind of intellectually and uh, the like people and social worlds that we're thinking with. Um, but yeah, I would be wary of saying that we shouldn't transfer those ideas because I think that's very limiting to only engage with kind of, I mean, and sort of like a, a form of, um, obviously changing the context, but a form of, yeah, kind of just like um, sort of siloing yourself off uh, in a way that I think can be quite dangerous and like one of the things that I think certainly um, in British universities one of the you know big problems is the kind of focus on uh, thought that's produced by a very limited group of people who are seen as kind of canonical and the whole point of doing this kind of like post and decolonial work is to try and bring in thought from like a like global perspective um, so yeah I would uh agree that you know there's always risks involved maybe but like it's it's kind of part of what uh post and decolonial scholarship is i think um yeah sorry i think i've like lost the thread of maybe some of the other questions um but yeah I think I'll that's okay that. great thanks saskia megan do you want to sure i'll jump in uh so um, I'll start with the question about disciplinary um, lines and whether they dissolve um, in the in the process of the decolonial project um, or whether there's still some value in them. Um, I, I, I have come to change my mind um, about this. I, I was a reluctant sociologist, um, an enthusiastic post-colonial theorist, and um, and uh, recently have, have come to see the value of um, thinking critically through the history of sociology and thinking sociology, sociologically about post-colonial and decolonial thought. Um, uh, Gurminder and John's work has been very helpful um, in that regard. Uh, Julian Goh's work and Ali's um, book on decolonizing sociology. Um, if we look at the imperial history of sociology, we look at the ways in which the discipline was constructed um, in the service of empire and which it, and, and the ways in which it drew from colonial ways of thinking, um, you know, could to construct the canon, um, that that's a critique that needs to be made within sociology. Um, 
And at the same time, um, as Julian Goh argues, um, sociological social ontology um, has a lot to contribute to post-colonial critique. Um, uh, acknowledging uh, acknowledging uh, social ontology um, has a lot to contribute to post-colonial critique. Um, and so I think it's important to acknowledge that, and that that's not um, that's not uh, that doesn't apply exclusively to sociology. It applies to other disciplines as well. But you know, coming from my standpoint as a sociologist, I can see the value of um, a critique taking place within a discipline, um, and and certainly drawing from um, from literary criticism, from history, um, from politics as well. Um, but uh, but I, I, I do think there's value to, um, to having a specifically sociological debate about, um, about post-colonial and decolonial thought. Um, so Su Ming's point, um, if, I, if I understood you correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, it, you would ask um, what is the decolonial episteme beyond what it is not? Um, and am, am I remembering that correctly? Um, and, uh, and what is, uh, um, what can be said about, Say that the prospects for liberation. What does that look like in practice? Um, I, I think that's uh, I think that's what uh, what I understood you was saying. Um, I, I, I I, I try to get at this a bit in um, in the critical sociology paper when I talk about how to um, uh, what the process of liberate what the process of liberation looks like and um, and how and how decolonial thought works in, in practice there. Um, I, I focused in my intervention here um, mostly on colonial knowledges and on um, the power of colonial discourses. Um, but I, I would also argue that um, uh, because coloniality is power laden, because it's sticky, because it's often invisible and because um, it plays out differently in different contexts, it's not singular or universal. Um, decolonization um, also must be both global, it must be variegated, it must um, target discourses as well as, um, as institutions, as well as identities, um, and it must be multiple um, and ongoing. Um, it, uh, if, if colonialism is the imposition of, um, of power, um, then decolonization is, um, is uh, it is, is multiple, is plural, is um, uh, expression without um, without imposition, without um, coercive um, uh, the coercive imposition of, of power. Um, it, it's it's it, it's not uh, it's probably not a satisfying response, and I'm, I'm reluctant to say anything universal about what decolonization looks like for that very purpose. That um that to say something universal um, would uh, would uh, would mimic um, the uh, the, the colonial in that respect. Um, but I can certainly look to um, movements like the Tricontinental, um, like the World Social Forum, um, like the Indigenous Climate Movement for a window into what the decolonial looks like in practice. Um, so leave that there. Great, thanks, Megan. Ali? Um, yeah, thanks. I think I'll just pick up on uh, what Megan was talking about in response to Su Ming's really interesting question, because I think that what's really kind of central to this politics of pluriversality is, is this notion of double translation, right? So it's not just the case of, I know someone was talking about using theory from Latin America or kind of like exporting theory from Latin America and using it in the context of South Africa. Um, it's, it's not that kind of one way translation, which is kind of how the logic of coloniality works, but the double translation basically is, um, it is encouraging conversation and double translation is not my own term. So I don't want to take any credit for that. <laughs> so I, I take that from Walter Mignolo. Um, but a really good example of that is Franz Fanon and Ali Shariati when they met in Paris because um, Shariati was coming from an anti-colonial, anti-imperial perspective, which was deeply inspired by the principles of Shia Islam. Whereas many of us know that Fanon was actually very skeptical about the role of religion in revolutions because he saw it as a way of the elite creating new, new forms of social division and new forms of social inequality in their attempts of being so-called anti-colonial. And through this kind of double translation between Fanon and Shariati, Shariati literally translating Fanon's works into Arabic for Iranian revolutionaries, but Fanon also engaging with Shariati's work, what we see is that they both kind of come to this recognition where it's like, maybe they have a disagreement over the role of religion in revolutions, 
but they can understand that speaking from their particular geopolitical locations, um, that the way that they come to their different points of view makes complete sense in their particular anti-colonial struggles. And indeed, what you see with Shariati's work is um, that he takes the anti-colonial work of Fanon and applies it to different processes to what Fanon was talking about. In particular, I'm thinking about American imperialism um, in Iran in the same way that Fanon was able to see how the work on anti-colonial or anti-imperialism in Iran was also important for thinking about post-colonial North Africa and the Caribbean. Um, so that's what I will say about that kind of question of pluriversalism, which I think is just really, really important. And I think that um, just to kind of conclude the really important thing about all decolonial thinking um, and this whole project of pluriversalism is that we need to look at the pathways out of, of colonization. So decolonization is an unfinished project. So we need to find our ways out of colonization, but we have to realize that some of these pathways out of colonization already exist and or did exist in the pre-colonial era, but some of the pathways don't yet exist. So I think that there is also like a deliberate openness in terms of, look, we can't just rely on history. We need to really think concretely about what can we do in the future to create new forms of social, um, to create new forms of social living and social organization. So I think that I'll leave it like that. I could say a lot about working at Cambridge, but I think that you can already guess what I would say, so there's no point. All right, thanks for that, all of you. I thought we might have time for another round, but we're sort of really coming up towards the end of the time of this session. Thank you so much to the panelists for their initial sort of presentations and opening up of the space of the conversation. And I think we can all see how productive it's been in terms of the range and the quality of the questions and the comments that have come in from the floor, I want to say, but it's through the screen really these days, isn't it? So it's like our words have to change as the technologies we use change to communicate with each other and, and so on. And I think just sort of related to that, I think one last thing that I would want to say about the sort of concepts and the ways in which we engage with them is partly this idea that Concepts do emerge within communities. Sometimes those communities are in struggle. Often those communities are in struggle and the concepts emerge as ways of people or, or through ways of trying to make sense of the situations within which we find ourselves. So in that sense, concepts are located in communities. They have histories and those communities and histories then come to define fields. I think we fail as academics, those of us who are here as academics, to the extent that we remain within those fields and think that all there is to do is defend the boundaries of the field, as opposed to think about what we can see from where we are and how if we engage with others, yet more vistas might open up. And so these concepts are only ever tools that we can use to try and see the world better. And the only reason to try and see the world better is to try and make the world better. So, you know, go forth and be in struggle and let's see what we can do. But thank you so much to all of you for this. It was great. I'll try and save the chat. I'm not, you know, I did remember to record the event. So that will definitely be on the uh, British Sociological Association's YouTube channel. I'll try and save the chat if I can. Mm. Hopefully you've... Uh, you know, managed to save the bits of information you wanted anyway, but we'll try and find a way of attaching that to the to the video on, on YouTube. And we are having a series of events. So they're going to be monthly events. The, the next couple are organized in relation to the Anthropocene and climate. And um, I'll just put a link to the next one in the chat. So the next event is next month in November on decolonizing the Anthropocene. And we've got the speakers, Francois Verges, and Catherine Youssef, who will be speaking, and the event will be chaired by Megan. You can register on the link here. We'll also circulate it via Twitter and on the email channels. Please do sign up to the email list if you'd like to get regular notifications about the events we hold. And then there'll be another event in December reflecting on COP26 in the context of colonialism and climate. And we have some great speakers lined up for that event as well. Alice Ma, Hardeep Paul, and, um, oh, I've just forgotten his name. It's terrible. Another fabulous speaker as well. And we'll circulate details of that. 
but thank you so much for staying till the end. It's great to see so many of you here and um, hope to see you again next time. Okay, bye.